oh my god, there's this hole in the trade tower. There's this, there was this ball of fire. I heard an explosion, looked uh, through my window, and uh, I saw the, the first uh, building in, in flames and uh, catch the, the exploding debris. As you can well imagine, everybody was taken completely by surprise that anything as uh, dramatic and as horrendous as this would take place in America. But we, uh, of course, immediately reacted, and I think uh, reacted positively. We, we quickly established a, a, a command center, uh, a mini command center here uh, in the office of the Surgeon General, being prepared to respond to that which the, the office of the Secretary may request of us. I immediately activated our operations center and we were up and operating within minutes after the first plane crashed into the North Tower. As soon as the plane crashed into the South Tower, I was absolutely convinced that this was a terrorist event. People then realized this was not just a plane accident. This was an attack and um, we started thinking right off what we had to do. The entire tone at the office changed immediately. As soon as the second plane hit, um, we went from the curiosity of, uh, of breaking news to we have a situation that we've got to start getting ready for. It was pretty apparent that World Trade Center was going to need some services, and so we started looking to see what could we do. And our office uh, did the, something quite unusual. For the very first time, we stood up every entire DMAT team that we own. We told them, get prepped, tell us who's ready to roll. And I knew right then what I, I had to do um, in terms of emergency training that we've had since we're the emergency support function for the federal response plan that deals with um, health and medicine, uh, the health and medical response, I went straight to uh, the, the FEMA office. We were the, in charge of health and uh, medical care and public health, so we had uh, uh, among very close to us the New York City Department of Health, CDC, SAMHSA, and uh, EPA, uh, and the State Department of Health. I had to concentrate on my task. And the task was that, you know, we had this bright idea of putting together a triage center. We were trying to get ambulances. I wanted, you know, the people that were standing along the side of the building obviously had come in off the street, so it was very congested inside there. We had a couple of people who were actually, by that point, quite, quite ill. Yeah, I need the staff down here, bring supplies. Um, and uh, I also asked that uh, folks from the Department of Mental Health, which was just down the street, send over some social workers, and I just got to work. We knew that despite how, how prepared this city is and, and, and how vast its resources are, this was going to overwhelm them somehow, and, 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 and federal resources were going to be necessary. Things were moving pretty fast and furious, and then plane number three came into the Pentagon. And I don't know if you remember that day, but we lost all telephone uh, communication. And then suddenly we were like, um, our primary source of being able to reach people was knocked out. Communication was really very spotty. We didn't completely lose it, not, not for very long. It was, it was hard to make phone calls. It was hard to get cell phone calls out. It was, it was hard to reach people for long periods of time. but. Um, uh, we, we knew what the other people were going to be doing. We knew, they knew what we would probably be doing. Suddenly, like, the building just shook and there was this, there was just noise, like, boom, you know, real shaking of the building. I mean, and I, you know, I, I came downstairs and I just thought, oh my God, this is going on. This is ongoing attack and, and, you know, I, I knew that I was going to die today. But suddenly I looked out and like people were running. And, and whereas before it was, you know, tens, hundreds, you know, there were thousands of people, just like a seething mass of humanity just running up the street, followed by all kinds of particulate, like a cloud of particulates and debris and stuff flying around. And I, it was, Awful. When the towers went down, you had a totally different scenario. Um, 
when the Pentagon was hit, when the other plane crashed in Pennsylvania, now you had the additional activity of a plane crash in Pennsylvania, which would be a normally a large response for OEP anyway, two buildings collapsing, huge unprecedented scale of response was going to be required for that, and then simultaneously having to respond then to another building collapse and plane crash in D.C. Originally we didn't know how many, um, how many injured and wounded there were and um, what the capacities were going to be in the hospitals. We didn't have a real good status report on some of the downtown hospitals and what their capabilities were. Uh, so we were planning on bringing in teams um, to support both the local infrastructure as well as provide medical care at the site. The local teams for New York, we moved them into place to deal with uh, the situation in New York in a pre-stage outside of New York City. Our push package teams were going to D.C deal with the Pentagon situation, and we were at the same time trying to mobilize a management support team with DMORD assets to be able to move immediately to the Pennsylvania site. Our uh, initial uh, thinking was to have the New York City hospitals ready for a large number of casualties, that uh, uh, after the first two or three hours it became evident that that was not the case, it was not needed, that the disaster was taking a different uh, uh, kind of a nature. And we were waiting for like waves of casualties to be dug out and, and there just sort of came this eerie point when we realized everybody must be dead. These were just people going to work. And then, then the real mission emerged that, that we, that we uh, carried out here, and that was administering uh, first aid and primary care to um, the workers who, who were digging frantically at that point. We w didn't come in to, to, and, and respond to the injuries that we anticipated, but we found uh, another very important role. The attack itself was not a public health attack, per se, yet the results of it had tremendous public health implications. When the dust started to settle, and we're talking hours or days later, not instantly like it looks on TV, and when the firefighters regrouped and had some time to rest and recover, they noticed the complaints that I'm just mentioning, tremendous eye irritation tremendous nasal and sinus irritation, throat irritation, coughing. So that what was happening at the World Trade Center site was that uh, unregulated and unorganized volunteer response was taking place. Um, that was replaced as a decision by the New York City government to use a system that was well managed, which is why they trained um, they turned to the National Disaster Medical System and to our department to provide the response at the World Trade Center site. So what the Public Health Service did was to step in and, and really help uh, give the city some organized medical response. Our main responsibilities within the Commission Corps Readiness Force are to provide very specific technical expertise in the event of, of a crisis or emergency or to augment uh, other assets that are going out the door. We provided officers in experts in numbers of one to full medical teams in numbers of 40. We supported medical missions, we supported uh, public health missions, we supported environmental missions. We had officers across every category, across every agency, across every grade, every level of experience and training um, going out the door. We would be sending a 43 person team. They had a very specific mix that they wanted in terms of they wanted for example at least four physicians. They wanted at least um, I think you know somewhere between five and seven mid-level individuals. Then they wanted a complement of nurses and EMTs. They wanted pharmacists. The fact that we had physicians, EMS, and later the federal uh, health uh, professionals on the scene uh, was a tremendous benefit because the firefighters goal, the city's goal, was to have these heroes continue to operate. Oh, we felt that many could still be saved and you don't want 
your first responders, your rescuers having to leave the scene to get medical attention. They knew these people weren't going to leave. Um, and the big effort they wanted to make was keeping them as healthy as they could while they went back to work on that pile. We were able to move um, medical units into each of those quadrants and make them visible. And where they weren't entirely visible, we were able to put up uh, just makeshift signs uh, directing people to where they could get respirators, where they could get medical care. And in tracking the numbers um, on an hourly basis, uh, which we were doing uh, throughout, we were able to see a marked increase in the number of patient contacts. We want to be able to provide the expertise that's being needed within a specific response. And in many cases, it, it's, not, you know, it's not sufficient to simply provide a nurse or a physician or an engineer. It requires that you provide the right nurse, the right physician, the right engineer. People who are going to be capable of going out and, and, and being able to deal with a very unique, very difficult situation of being at ground zero for two weeks in very austere conditions. Um, I mean, there's some just amazing, amazing stories that, that came from Ground Zero that, that I, I could never do justice to. The, our, our first shift um, was uh, the night shift. People just standing on the side of the road with signs, banners, screaming, you are our hero, you know, go, 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 USA. I mean, we, we, we went from kidding around in some banner that everybody just like, this, this, this is real. And when we got there um, and we walked out to um, the ground zero, you, you know, being late at night with the lights and, and the shadows was, I think even created, made it even more um, eerie than seeing it, you know, in the light of day. It was, it was, it was frightening to see. The very first day was hard. It was very hard. Um, it was easier to look at the people than it was to look at the buildings and the absence of the buildings. It was harder for me to look at, at what was left because I felt like there were so many voices and feelings and personalities attached to that rubble. I remember seeing smoke. I remember seeing a, a huge pile of rubble. Um, I felt like I was in the middle of a war zone. I've never been in one, but that was the impact that I felt. I mean, the sounds of the crane, were, I, I will never forget that. And you could, you could just always hear it, because it was right outside that clinic. And it was a screeching sound. Um, it, it really was almost as if, you know, the buildings were crying. When we got to ground zero, uh, immediately, you, you can just you can smell, you can feel, taste uh, how bad uh, the, the air quality was. This is really heavy duty rescue recovery in a construction like atmosphere. Uh, the only similarities would be a war zone, an earthquake, a volcano. So you're dealing with a lot of rubble uh, and people having to move very rapidly to find uh, people that might be injured, that might be still recoverable. We were seeing, you know, we were seeing a lot of foot injuries, ankle injuries, where they would step off of something, hand injuries and blisters. Um, another major thing that we saw that most of the men seemed to have was tremendous chapped lips. It doesn't sound very bad, but it was a signal to us that one, they weren't hydrated well, two, it was overly, overly hot in there and they were, um, you know, just searing off and we knew if we didn't take care of just some of the basic things like that, it would get worse. They would get infections, they would get open sores. You know, they needed to keep themselves healthy um, and that uh, working long hours uh, might not be the best they can do because once they burn out, we start losing numbers. They need to be hydrated. I educated them about hygiene, you know, changing of socks, keeping your feet dry. One of the things we, we try to do is uh, make sure that um, there were adequate number of respirators for rescue workers. Uh, we decided to also have um, replacement cartridges and, and respir uh, respirators also at, uh, at the clinics. My role was to be a mid-level provider, so that would be a nurse practitioner. Managing um, injuries, burns, for example, to uh, providing, you know, 
simple care, blister care management for these folks who have been on their feet for hours. Well, as a pharmacist, uh, my main uh, responsibilities was to assure that we had appropriate supplies and et cetera. Uh, but everybody on the team is, is trained as a first responder so we can jump in and, and help out uh, with uh, whatever is necessary. You know, we saw a guy, his leg was broken and he's still trying to go out on the pal to help, you know, dig people out, to do whatever he could. And meanwhile, you see him like, uh, you know, he can't even walk on his leg, but he wants to go back out and help. And we're like, wait a minute, you need to come see us. Please come see us because if your leg is broken and you continue to walk on it, you're going to make your injury worse than what it is. Um, the first two days, the best thing I think I felt like I did medically was pull out a cot. They would lay down and within a minute they were sound asleep. I mean, just completely asleep. Um, they weren't coming in for Band-Aids, they weren't coming in for Kleenex, they weren't coming in for anything else, but they would see that cot and they would get an hour of sleep and by their look you'd think it would be a day, but within one hour they knew it was time for them to go back. Talk to them, make sure you talk to them, make sure you just tell, ask them how they're doing. Um, they may, you know, open up to you. It's just been so important just to talk, talk to them. They oftentimes have that kind of far away look in their eye. Um, they often maybe I'll just want to go and, and sit in a corner. Uh, and as I would get them to talk, then over time as maybe we stood there 15, 20 minutes, maybe longer, uh, conversation would lead from one thing to another to another. There was a man who was looked like he was a steel worker, an iron worker. And, he said, I'm just looking for my brother, I'm just looking for my brother. And I said, well, what, it, what is his name? And he told me his name. And there were two lists. There was one list of, a, of just their names, and then there was another list with their picture and their name below it. And he said, oh, there's his name. And he said, I just have to find my brother's picture, and the, I, I just have to do it, I just have to do it. And so I saw the picture, and but I, I kind of thought, well, I'm just going to wait until he finds it. Um, again, not really knowing why, but I thought I'd just be there to support him. He turned to me and he said, that's, that's my brother. And I thought, how could, you know, how could you, that was his real brother. And I can't, I, you know, like at that point I thought, how could you be, you're out here, you're trying to help do your duty at the same time, you're, you're struggling because you're looking for your brother in all this rubble. And I just had so much, I had so much respect for him. I, I just, you know, I hugged him and I thought that was part of my job was to help folks deal with all the emotions of being at the, this disaster. medical examiner needed dentists to assist in the forensics portion of what they were trying to do in identifying these thousands of body parts and, and victims and we were able to provide 15. Um, again we went back to our membership and we found people that had already had the specialized training that they needed. That aspect of uh, dentistry is handled for the most part with uh, the armed forces and DMORT. And so to be deployed in this type of mission is pretty unusual. Previous to all the advancements of DNA, dental identification is the only, was the only scientific way to verify who you were trying to identify. Well, most of what we saw were not intact bodies. Most of it was parts and, and pieces, I guess you would say, uh, sections of a mandible or a couple teeth, um, various bones of the jaw, and um, so it was kind of our job just to, you know, identify them, examine them, x-ray them um, to the best we could with what we had to work with because basically all of our work was to give them closure and so it was a very emotional subject in that matter. Uh, 
Um, the Office of Emergency Preparedness, particularly through our Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Teams, the DMORTs, um, we have an agreement with uh, National Transportation Safety Board, with NTSB, to support them during major plane crashes. When we arrived in Somerset, they, they sh gave us a couple choices of where, where we were going to set up the morgue. So we first looked at uh, our options and, and then started making plans to start doing our job. Yeah, I was assigned to work as a mental health person for that team as well as to the uh, what we call the Disaster Mortuary Operations Respond Team, the DMOR team. So it was quite an experience because I have never done that before like many of us who helped out. And at that point in time I realized um, that it was a very important job to do and why mental health was needed uh, because many of us were seeing things we had never seen before. I was there and the MST was there to support the mortuary officers. They had about a total of around 40 mortuary people that were processing um, remains from the crash. Plus we also had a family assistance uh, personnel there too, working with the families, doing DNA blood draws. In order for us to help identify remains, we need to ask pertinent questions. So I was asked to sit in some of the interviews while family members were asked very specific questions of their loved ones. And it's important that we inform the individuals, the family members, that they may have a depression set in, stress will build up two to three months after the fact, and it's important that they seek some kind of counseling. When the first anthrax case um, hit down in Florida. You know, it was just like somebody punched me in the stomach. In Florida, we started with a single isolated inhalational case. That means something very, very unique. In, in New York City, we started with a single cutaneous case. Is there aerosol risk for inhalational disease or not? And then in Washington, with the delivery of a contaminated letter to Senator Daschle's office that was opened, we faced yet a third scenario where instead of starting with clinical disease, you're starting with an exposure event, a defined exposure event to a known contaminated letter. We actually went into the Hart building. We were a floor below where the Daschle letter was opened. And they needed us to be able to do a number of things. First off, to take care of the people that were primarily exposed and, and I probably swabbed more noses in that one week than I've done in my entire nursing career. Um, but it wasn't just collecting a sample. People were scared. We needed to talk to them. We needed to explain what their risks were. We needed to talk to them about the drugs that we were offering and make sure that they understood both the risk and the benefits of taking the medication. So if you worked in X office or had been in that office for a certain amount of time on particular days, you were part of the risk group and were given the prophylactic antibiotics initially at that time for 60 days. Um, and other people who were not part of that group were given um, antibiotics as well but it was a prophylaxis that was given for only three days and then it was extended to five days until test results from the mass nasal swabbing came back to where the team could decide who and what groups were at risk. None of us had ever responded to something like this, a, ma a mass prophylaxis campaign where we had to give out medications to, to tens of thousands of people and it allowed us to learn. Um, from the first day at the Capitol, with it being chaotic, we still got the job done and people got very good care, but it was still, it, it, it wasn't the ideal situation. And even just by the next day, we had written information in front of us, we had the flow down, we had all the information we needed. The following week when we were at DC General, it even got better. We had a bigger facility, we had people in place to talk with the media. But probably the biggest contribution that we were able to do in that entire event was to put out excellent public information. The other investment that was large and uh, but turned out to be very important was the national pharmaceutical stockpile. Um, it basically performed without ever missing a beat. Um, even as the investigation 
unfolded and became enormously complex. Um, they were able to move people, materials, specimens, antibiotics, vaccine, um, to everywhere it needed to be, you know, uh, at the time it needed to be there. But I think if people wouldn't have reacted and responded as quickly, we maybe would have seen more deaths, um, a lot more deaths. The investment in the laboratory response network for bioterrorism at a national level was fabulous. Uh, I don't know what we would have done without that capacity. If you can imagine the confusion that would have resulted had we not had standard validated methods um, and reagents available at widely distributed laboratories within the public health system, um, it would have been um, a catastrophe. The federal government has a, has a uh, reputation of not working well with each other, the various departments. But in this case, there wasn't any uh, turf battles whatsoever. Everybody uh, rolled up their sleeves and said, we have a national disaster here. We're under attack by we don't know by whom or by what, and we don't know what the, the next attack is going to be. So let's, let's do our job properly. Absolutely no doubt in my mind that because of the activities of the Commission Corps Readiness Force and the National Disaster Medical System, we were saving lives. We are not over the threat. We are simply in a pause. We have a responsibility as a nation and as a government to use that pause to take the lessons learned and to prepare ourselves for what we can anticipate will be another phase. You know, Pandora is out of the box um, in this regard. And we are going to have to maintain a much higher level of preparedness and capacity to respond to these events um, than we have in the past. Planning needs to continue for different types of scenarios, different uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, biologicals are one, and uh, but chemicals are another, like sarin that happened in Japan. And I think people will look to us to come out and help. You have the um, Homeland Security now, which the Commission Corps is a part of. Um, and all kind of disaster preparedness plans are being put in place. So I, th I think we'll be more than ready. We trained about 100 folks to work in um, a, a bioterrorism type of an event, and uh, we plan on continuing to have more of those classes in the future. Um, our piece is we want people to know how to ta first take care of themselves so that they can then take care of their families and their patients. And we're working in that direction right now. You know, as individuals, we might have limitations, but as a group, I think we 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 cover each other. Uh, and I think there was there was not a moment uh, at all that I ever uh, felt that we would not be able to handle what was thrown at us. Not having the Commission Corps of the Public Health Service available, I think, would have slowed down the response that this department would have had, would have made it more difficult for us to mobilize and to get to where we needed to be as a department, as one department, with one message, with one mission. And the Commission Corps, I think, really showed what it really could do. When they identified four people to go out and throw that first pitch, they had a cop, they had a fireman, they had a Port Authority police officer, and they had a member of NDMS. Those were the four people that, uh, that New York identified as the people they wanted to represent them. And I pointed to that picture and I said, that, that's why we're putting up with everything you're doing here. That's why you're coming in here, you're working these hours, that's why you're doing it. You're doing it because the people in New York feel like what we're doing is one of the four most important people they have there. You know, you're supporting their heroes. <laughs>